Meet me in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. All right, very familiar passage for, um, you know, many of us here. Now, the word of the Lord reads, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Did everybody say Gethsemane? Now, by, de by definition, Gethsemane uh, means oil press. That's where the oil was pressed. So we can look at Gethsemane as the crushing place. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and said to them, sit here while I go there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, Peter, James, and John, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Jesus is going through something right here, y'all. He said, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. I grew up on the King James Version, so all the scriptures I know are in the King James, but I read the NIV because, you know, we, we, we have to in some essence. But I love the King James because right here it says, nevertheless, nevertheless, yet not as I will, but as thy will. So now, here in this moment, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is in a very dark place in his life. He's asking for the Lord to remove the assignment from him. But then he needs to figure out whose will is greater, his will or the will of the Father. We're still in our sermon series, Soar. Everybody say, Soar. Do your hands like this, say, Soar. We're going somewhere in God, and we're talking about operating in order and excellence again. In order for you to get things in its proper order, you can't prioritize your will above God's. We're keeping things in order, and we're prioritizing His will. Come on, y'all, pray with me. Father, we thank you. God, we want to ask for forgiveness right now. All the times that we put our will, our agenda, our to-do list, our wishes, our desires above yours. But God, we're getting everything in this right order. And right now, Lord, we're reordering, we're reordering the patterns of our lives to follow what you say instead of what we desire. In Jesus' name. So in a couple weeks, I'll have um, my yearly physical. I'm saying yearly physical because that's what they call it. But for me, this is my physical of the decade, meaning I haven't had one in a long time. So let me speak to every man here in the house. And woman and child, but let me hit our men right now, because we don't go and see the doctors that often. Let's make sure we get on the doctor's calendar so we can get some checks. 
But as I digress, so I'm going to the doctor, and I already know what they're going to do. They're going to take all my vital signs. They're going to check my heart rate, um, draw some blood, maybe check some things um, internally to my body, however they do, what they do. But I already know that when I go see the doctor, when I sit up on that cold table with that white sheet, that after I answer all of their questions, I know that I'm not going to grab the stethoscope from the doctor. Listen to my own heart. I know I'm not going to take the shrimp from the doctor and stick it in my own vein and take my own blood. And the reason why I'm not going to do that is because I'm going to allow the medical professionals to do their job just as they're supposed to do. If you go and get an oil chain, You go to the mechanic to get an oil change. After you deliver your car to them, give them the keys. You don't drive your car up on the ramp yourself. Crawl underneath the car and change your own oil. And the reason why you don't do that is because you allow the mechanic to do their job just like they're supposed to do. All my ladies here in the house, I would imagine, because I've never been Whatever y'all do when you spend 12 hours at the beauty salon, I don't know. But I would imagine when you get there and you tell the beautician exactly what you want to do to your hair, how long or short you want it to be, how you want it curled or styled, I don't imagine, unless you all tell me differently, that you dip your head in the sink yourself. I don't think that you condition, put conditioner in your own head. I don't think you put grease on your own fingers and create your own finger waves in your own hair. I don't think that you do that because I would imagine you allow the beautician to do her job just like she's supposed to do. Whenever I go to a restaurant and I look at the menu and I decide whatever I want to eat, after I make the order, I don't go into the back and cook the food for myself because I allowed the chef to do his job just like he's supposed to do. I got a question for you. How come we allow everybody to do their job but God? Because when it comes to our faith, When it comes to our finances, when it comes to our family, for some reason, we all have the tendency to refuse to let God be God. I didn't tell y'all that's the title of the sermon here this morning, to let God be God. Because our problem is, is that we get in God's way for what God is trying to do in our lives. And let me enlighten everybody here. I don't need to wait to the end of the sermon to say you and I will be a lot better in life if we just surrender our will to the will of the Father. Because God is not going to entertain an arm wrestling contest with us. He's not going to fight us for our will. He's not going to struggle with us over his agenda. We have to make a decision whether we're going to submit and surrender to God or not. But I'm sure there's some saints that have lived long enough that you can testify that as long as you were holding on to what you wanted and you desired, the debt continued to accumulate, the health issues continued to come up, your money continued to get funny, and everything in your life was chaos. And the reason was is because your life was out of order because you would not let God be God. Everybody say, let God be God. No, say it like you mean it. Say, let God be God. Because so much in our lives would come together if we could just let God be God and we could be a believer. If your only job was just to trust God, you would see how God could work when you take yourself out the way. 
Let's talk briefly about the will of the Lord because we see throughout the Bible, they don't call them these terms, but in concepts, I'm going to give them to you. There are three primary wills that we see in the Bible. The, the first will is the providential will of God. Everybody say the providential will. This is the will of God that's based off of his providence. This means that God has already decided what was going to happen. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to fast about it. You don't have to give any money. You don't have to come to church. Or anything. There are certain things that God has ordained to happen, and there's no devil in hell that could do anything about it. This is where we see the example in the Bible to where there was a man who was blind. And they came to Jesus and said, Lord, who sins that caused this man to be blind? So they were trying to trace this man's vision impairment to a sickness and illness or a sin that somebody did. But Jesus said, no, it wasn't any of that. This man is blind because our Father in heaven chose for him to be blind. But he chose for him to be blind so that when I heal him, that his name might get glory. Because God has some things that he is destined to happen, and it does not matter what you do or don't do, it is going to come to pass. That is God's providential will. But then there's his moral will. Everybody say his moral will. So this is where we see all the thou shalls and thou's and shall not. So this is the will of the Lord that he has put out there, and he prays that we'll follow it. So this is the part where, where Jesus said, uh, uh, oh, yeah, do good to those who despitefully misuse you. Where he says, love your enemies. Forgive those that have hurt you. That's his moral will. So he, he, he desires that we will follow his moral will, but we have an option to do so. This is the will that God has laid out, and we don't need to pray about it because not everything we need to pray about. You don't need to pray about, Lord, somebody at my job, my family, they're, they're, they're bothering me, Lord. I just want to give them one good cursing. Lord, can I curse them out? No, you already know. That is not in his moral will. So we have the providential will, the moral will, and then there's his personal will. Everybody say personal will. Now, his personal will is not for anybody else but you. God has a personal will for everybody, and this is the will that shows up in different ways, shape, and form. This is the will of God that he has for you, whether you should move to Charlotte or Atlanta, whether you should buy this car or not that car, whether you should relocate and buy this house or not this house, or whether you should marry this person or not. This has to do with the Lord's personal will that is just for you. When we're talking about letting God be God today, we're talking about the struggle that we have with God's personal will that he has for us. The will that the Lord has that we may follow a journey with him that's going to lead us to a better place. But what everybody needs to know is that if we align with the will of God, particularly his personal will, that will take us somewhere, this is the will that God has designed not to be mean, but he's given us an individualistic will for us so that it may set us up for a life that we never could have imagined. Jesus, we're going to get him to him here in a moment. Jesus had to go to the cross, but him going to the cross was necessary so that he could reach the destiny that God had designed for him. Jesus' destiny was not to be on the cross. His destiny was to be at the right hand of the Father. But in order for him to reach Calvary, Jesus had to go through, in order for him to reach his destiny, he first had to go through Calvary. But in order for him to go through Calvary, he had to have his time in Gethsemane.
So all of us have to go through some hell in our lives. But it is designed to allow us to reach the destiny that God has aligned for each and every one of us. Right now, because I know the prophetic gift that I got, maybe, maybe not. I know there's many people in here, you're struggling right now with the will of God. That's your struggle. And you probably know what you should or should not do. But you're wrestling with God. And until you relinquish control, you'll be exactly where you are. Let's get into the scripture real quick. Here it is, Jesus, and I'll get through this quickly. Jesus now is in his latter days. He's in his latter days. He's had a three-year ministry that was successful, healing people, delivering people, setting people free, preaching the good news of what was to come. He prophesied that if you tear down this temple, talking about his body, in three days I will raise it up. Jesus is giving them all the instructions. But now Jesus is taking his disciples to Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane was a particular place, as I already mentioned. Gethsemane means the olive press. So, this was a garden to where olives were grown and they were pressed. And as they were pressed, whatever was coming out of it, the oil was made for good use. So now this Gethsemane, this Garden of Gethsemane, the olive place, this was the crushing place that was necessary. And I believe that it was strategic by God that he brought his disciples here. But now in verse 37, what it says here that I always thought was interesting, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. Jesus said he was sorrowful even to the point of death. He mentioned that in verse 37 and verse 38. And the Greek word for both of those is the closest word that we have to depression. Here's what's interesting. Jesus was God himself, but he was also a man. He was fully God, and he was fully man. And here it is. Jesus is struggling with depression. My Lord, how could God's guy be struggling with depression? Because if anybody should be strong enough to carry the weight of their assignment, it should be Jesus. But here it is, Jesus is struggling with depression, my Lord, because what that tells me, if the weight of the assignment and the weight of life got too heavy for Jesus and cause him to be sad. Don't let anybody criticize you because you're struggling with your own sadness in your own life. Come on, I'm talking to somebody here this morning. Because now what this shows is life gets heavy for everybody. And if life got heavy for Jesus, life can get heavy for you too. We don't talk about mental health in the black church because we all have this superman and superwoman syndrome to where we think that we got all the muscle, we got all the mind, we have everything needed, I got this, no, I'm good, I know what I need to do. But in the black church, we need to start talking about the fact that about 60% of us wake up every morning sad. That many of us go to bed scared 
that a lot of us are fearful of something that may or may not happen tomorrow. So I want to encourage everybody here, if you're struggling with some sadness in your life, you're not weird, you're not strange, there's nothing wrong with you, you're not broken, you're just dealing with the heaviness of life. And I pray that there's about 20 people in the house. Now let's lift that up to about 50 people. That's not a shame to say, yeah, God, I got some struggles in my mind that, God, sometimes I don't see the way. That, Lord, sometimes I'm scared. That, God, yes, yeah, sometimes I cry myself at night. If there's anyone else that ain't ashamed to be transparent and say, yeah, I love the Lord, but every once in a while, I got my own sadness in my life. And I want to encourage everybody here, if you deal with moments of depression and anxiety, join the club because we're all just humans having a natural experience. And if Jesus can have a bad day, guess what? You can have one too. So Jesus had the weight of his assignment. And what we see, he's struggling with thoughts of depression. Now, I believe Jesus had these thoughts of sadness, depression, anxiety for two reasons. The first reason is his assignment required him to take on the sins of the entire world. So Jesus had to take on the sins of everybody that ever lived. Everybody that lives in New York, everybody that lives in Africa, everybody that lives in Charlotte, everybody that lives in Oklahoma, Jesus had to take on the sins of everybody. And I know that's heavy because if he had to just take on my sins alone, now that's enough to weigh you down. If he had to deal with my stuff, that's enough to make somebody anxious. If he had to deal with all the stuff that I've done and all the things I've been through, now that's enough to make you question who you are in your own life. So if you multiply my life with all the people that have ever lived, it has placed Jesus in a depressive state. The second reason is because he had to take on our sin. But now because he had to take on our sin, the Bible says that it is sin that separates us from God. Jesus had been with God from the beginning. In John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus was there from the beginning. But now he had to take on all of our sins, all the things that we said and done, all the times that we were ugly, nasty, all the time that we cheated and stole, and all the times we were slept in the wrong beds and said the wrong things and went to wrong places, did things that we should not have done, gone places we shouldn't have. He had to take on all of that, and he knew when he took it on that the presence of God would be gone. Hence is why Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he knew that him becoming sin meant the presence of God would be gone. So now here Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, and he's struggling with his own form of depression. And now what we see as they were going to the garden Jesus started out with 12 disciples. Now, he knew he was going to have an encounter with God, but he started out with 12 disciples. But now he's down to 11 because one of them already betrayed him. So now he took 11. And so as they got from the Mount of Olives to the garden, that 11 went down to 8. Then when it went down to eight, he told Peter, James, and John, you all go with me as I pray. So it started at 12, went down to 11, went down to eight, and now is down to three. But then when it was three, Jesus went what Luke says, a stone's throw away 
to pray. And when he got done praying, the three that he brought, he found out that they were asleep. Isn't it interesting how you can start with about 12 people on your team, but the closer that you get to God, you'll start to see people that'll fall away. Because not everybody is built for your assignment. So I want to encourage everybody here. There are some places in God that you have to walk alone. A couple weeks ago, my son Anderson, he was having knee surgery. And so when he was having knee surgery, we, were, we checked him in at the front. And so here I was walking with him in the front. So I waited with him in the waiting room. So when they called our number, we went back to the, the prep room. So we got him prepped up. And then we took him to another place. And so here I am with him the entire time as he's getting ready for surgery. But then they put him on the bed and they strapped him up. And so as they're walking him back, I'm going alongside his side and there's a big sign that says, surgery. And so as it said surgery, I knew that I couldn't go back there with him because where he was going, he had to go by himself. My God, my God, let me encourage somebody here. Don't be scared to walk alone because some things that God is trying to get through to you, you are the only one that is built for the assignment, that you are the only one that have the faith to get you through, that yes, I know we want company around, but the closer we get to God, we may see that the company that started with us won't end with us, but glory be to God. Because God will meet you in Gethsemane. Even if they didn't go with you, God will already meet you there. Is there anybody else that can remember a time to where you had to go alone? And yes, you felt alone, but God met you right in the moment when you were by yourself. To God be the glory. I thank God for those moments now because I don't need a crowd around me. I don't need a big team around me. I don't need all the people surrounding me. Why? Well, because I'm good with God. As long as I got God ahead of me, it doesn't matter who's with me. So don't be mad anymore from the people that dropped off from your life. God allowed them to because the assignment is not for them, but the assignment is for you. To God be the glory. I thank God right now for my own life because I've seen people fall away. But as I've gotten closer to God, God said they weren't meant to be there to begin with. There are some places you have to go by yourself. And the team that you started with may not be the team that you end with, but bless God anyway, because God will meet you in your crushing place, that place of Gethsemane, that divorce that you had that was painful, that death of the loved one that was painful. You lost your house and that was painful. They repossessed your car. That was painful. You had that health situation. It was painful. But guess what? You're in the crushing place. But guess what? God is going to meet you when you're at Gethsemane. And as he meets you, y'all ain't getting this church. As God is meeting you in your Gethsemane, don't be afraid to walk alone. Because at the end of the day, all you need is you and God. And that's enough to make it happen. So here Jesus is going through his form of depression. But he knew he had to do this alone. But now Jesus came to a point to where as the weight of the assignment was too heavy for him, he articulated from his mouth in verse 37, he said, 38, he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That this was more than Jesus just feeling a certain way. 
Church, this was heavy for Jesus. And so now he says, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And so going a little while further, as he went on from where he was with the disciples, the Bible says he fell with his face to the ground and Jesus prayed. And in his prayer, the first part of it, he said, my father, if it be possible, ah, this is a lot, if it be possible possible lord remove this cup from me the cup rep represented the assignment that he had that was too heavy jesus in his moment of sadness is saying lord this is too much for me have you ever gotten to a point in your life to where you've articulated to God, God, this is too much. Is there anyone who said, Lord, this is too much for me to handle? God, I know I believe in you, Lord, but this is too heavy. God, I can't do this, Lord. I'm ready to throw in the white towel. I don't know, and I'm doing a roll call here today because I need, all, I need to bring to the attention everybody who's ever wanted to give up. And I'm talking about not just give up on your spouse, not just give up on your job, but you want to give up on God because Jesus is at that point to where he's saying, Lord, this is too much. And if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Lord, take it away. Jesus saying, Lord, I know we talked about this in eternity before everything was created. But God, I can't do this anymore. Take the assignment away. But then something stirred up in Jesus to where he said, I know I said what I said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thou will be done. Glory be to God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thou will be done. Let me give y'all a quick story real quick. I heard a story one time about some guys that went to a lake that were swimming. And so one of them was an expert swimming. Three of them were average or okay swimmers. And the, the fourth one was like me, couldn't swim at all. So we had a very good swimmer, an average swimmers, and one that was not good at all, a poor swimmer. So they were at the lake on the boat, and the poor swimmer hopped in the water for only God. God knows why and started to drown and as he's drowning he's trying to save himself but he's swimming and he's swinging and so everybody the average swimmers they're looking at the great the expert swimming and saying are you going to do anything about this and so he's looking at them and shaking his head and says no but then the one that is in the water drowning, when he stops fighting and begins to go under, then the expert swimmer hops in and saves him. When they got back to the shore, they asked him, they said he could have died. Why did you not save him earlier? He said, I couldn't save him until he surrendered. Because if I'd have hopped in while he was fighting, we both would have died. But to God be the glory, when you get to a point of surrendering and stop fighting God, then God can take over. To God be the glory. Everybody stand. Everybody stand.